Okay, this is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Keeping the World Company. We're going to talk about the power of the arsenal facing Israel and the world. There are weapons coming from far away, sometimes very close. And if this show is as fun as I think it's going to be, we're going to make a musical out of it, right? Uh, so, <laughs> Dean Rosenfeld, our esteemed uh, guest, uh, and uh, uh, Tim Apicella, our co-host. Welcome to the show, Good you morning. guys. So, um, and what we have is, uh, you know, you watch a war or a couple of wars we got, and you try to learn things. You learn things not only about what's happening in the war zone, but you learn things about what's happening in the world as the world relates to the war zones. And in this case, um, we should have been surprised. We are surprised that Hamas has very advanced weapons they somehow acquired. Uh, with Iran's help and funding, and Iran makes some of those weapons. They make kits so that Hamas can make weapons itself in the tunnels. And we have weapons coming from North Korea. We have weapons coming from Russia. You know, the uh, you know the, the, the rifles are uh, what are they? What are they? Tim? AK forty seven. AK forty seven is the weapon of choice, and and all kinds of you know grenades and missiles and mortars and all that. And this is this is not. Um, the kind of weapons that terrorists have customarily used. This is we're in a new place here, a new dawn, if you will, um, where weapons are coming in that are way beyond what terrorists used in the past. And then they're coming in from all over the world. Modern sniper rifles, high tech sniper rifles, paragliders, RPGs, magnet bombs, one way attack drones, mini subs, landmines anti-tank missiles, long-range missiles that, I mean, really long-range that from Hamas in Gaza can strike Haifa and even a lot, which is on the Red Sea in the south. Um, so we have a huge increase of the mm, variety of weapons, the high-tech quality of weapons, uh, and I guess they have enough money to buy or build those weapons. Maybe some countries supply them with the weapons. And it's a new time, isn't it, Tim? Well, as we discussed in a uh, previous show, is really the advent of, of drone warfare. And drone warfare really isn't that expensive. Um, those produced in the United States are very expensive, but um, China and Iran can produce them fairly cheaply and export those, and they are exporting them. And so there's the, there's the wrinkle right there is uh, your ability to hit a target and uh, be miles away and um, not leave much of a signature and get away. And so, yeah, it's a new day. Yeah. And I was telling you that, um, you know, in Think Tech here, we had a show about drones back in 2015, 2016, 2017. And the drones were fun. They, they were the, the kind of toy that you could buy at a toy store. And um, who could think that the drones could turn into weapons? And they have turned into formidable weapons. Gene, you know, have you been watching this? Are you are you following exactly how deadly these weapons can be, the drone weapons? Not any more than the ordinary citizen. I am not an expert on arms and weapons, but I, I can talk to you about proportionality because that makes a difference. Every war is almost, almost every war now is hybrid because it's not only what plays out on the ground, but what plays out on the airway. And you have seen how quickly proportionality has become a big issue in the Gaza war. Now they are saying that the Israelis first came in with bombs that were way too heavy for precision targeting. And there will be a reckoning after this war with both sides. And one of the things that Israel is now vulnerable to in terms of the war on the airwaves and the screens is proportionality. Well, you know, that, that you really wonder. There they are flying their, their jet fighters over Gaza. Do, do they really need to? If they had the most modern technology, and they could because they're technologically, you know, oriented, uh, and they have arguably have the money to buy any kind of weapon, um, then perhaps it would be more precision, wouldn't it? And uh, you could have guided missiles that would, you know, hit a target that's very small 
um, and avoid all this I want to say collateral destruction and damage. And so um, probably in the future, after this reckoning you're talking about, Gene, we will see the emergence of weapons that are very focused. Um, and drones will be a big one. Well, it's very ironic that one of the perceived problems in Ukraine is that we're not giving them big enough bombs. And in Gaza, they're using bombs that are too big. This is what is being said now. Um, Israel should have access to more targeted precision weapons. It's very advanced technologically, and it has the United States on its side. And if anybody has access to weapons, it's the United States. We are the, we are the most powerful nation in the world militarily. We worry about China and the Asia Pacific. China is a midget compared to us right now, and they're scrambling to be at parity with us. Yeah, uh, Tim, let's talk about cost. If, if I have a, I don't know what, an F-16 or an F-35 flying out there, that's, that's hundreds of millions for each one, I think. Um, and then if I have big bombs, those are expensive. Um, but if I have a drone, which is precision, or a missile that is precision, it's cheaper, isn't it? Isn't the cost of these weapons that can be used by Hamas and other terror organizations, in fact, by anybody, isn't the cost going down? You know, and drone warfare is the great equalizer. Uh, let's look at what Ukraine was able to do against Russia's tank invasion, and he completely decimated it, and um, thanks to drone warfare. Now, did they have that in place uh, before the invasion? Yeah, I think they did, because remember, the United States was working with Ukraine for years and years, uh, basically, what, since 2014, as far as trying to uh, fortify their military and keep a, a complete invasion from the Crimean area to into Ukraine. So um, it's a great equalizer. It's pennies on the dollar. And, uh, you know, in the early parts of the Ukraine war, um, they were using, you know, basically, uh, I'll, I'll use the name Radio Shack, Radio Shack type of drones uh, that you could buy for $150 and, um, you know, attach a single uh, ordnance to it and drop it down at you know, down on top of a tank, and it would seem to be somewhat effective. $150 versus a United States drone, which is, I believe, if I remember the number right, was uh, in the neighborhood of $20 million. Yeah, true. We still have them, but you know what? It, they're not as useful anymore, and um, uh, we'll probably have better ones in the future. This all reminds me of the story of Zapp's Latiper. He was a, uh, I think he was a four-star admiral in the Navy and he was a uh, flyer and he got to be very senior because of what happened in the first Gulf War. What happened is he went to the, uh, he was stationed here. He went to the radio shack you mentioned uh, in Kailua and he bought a dish, okay? And he put the dish on the fantail of his ship. And every morning they would have a big meeting on the aircraft carrier in the Gulf. And he would be ahead in terms of intelligence of anybody else, any of the other admirals in the room. Why? Because with the dish, he was looking at CNN and CNN was telling him more than the guys in the room knew. And, and people were very impressed with that because it was creative and it used consumer technology. And I think there's a crossover between consumer technology, especially high tech things uh, and, um, and, and weapons. And war systems, you know, and 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 that that brings me to AI, you know, because we've been talking about AI all day long on Think Tech. We've had many many shows about AI, and I don't know how. Maybe one of you guys knows how, but I think AI is going to change this paradigm also. And the next time you look, these weapons I've just read off will be all the more powerful, all the more precision than before using AI. What do you think, Jean? You've heard of DARPA, the organization that brings together brains in the civilian sector. I know somebody uh, who works with DARPA, who's an academic, and um, they're, they're always way ahead of anything we get in the news. And years ago, they were talking about AI. And when we have a new technology, traditionally, historically, what happens, like my dad was a radar man in the South Pacific. Um, is 
it goes first to the military and has a military use. That's how computers were used too. And then later after the war, there's this big technological bump in society because what was used in the war that was tested and found to be um, useful then becomes commercial, commercialized. So yeah, I mean, the military and DARPA are all into sorts of things that we don't even know about yet. Yeah, the, old, the, the dual use development of military hardware and it can be used in both both of those sectors and we have that and sometimes you don't know so what i what i get out of this tim is that you know these weapons are not only for terrorists and not only for hamas that you need to have weapons like this on both sides and hopefully in that way you avoid the big klutzy expensive nuclear weapons at the same time, this may be redefining war. What do you think? Well, with every war, you find out very soon what technological advances have taken place bet between uh, the last war and the current war. Um, you know, I'm thinking of World War I where, you know, the lining people up in a line, um, that went the way of the dodo bird. It's, you know, machine guns changed that whole technology of warfare um, then we, you know, then you went into trench warfare with World War I and the uh, advent of airplanes and tanks really changed the battlefield. So that certainly wasn't in place, um, you know, years earlier in the, in the Civil War, of course. And then World War II, you had the advancement of radar and all, all sorts of proximity bombs in the air. Um, you know, each, each war brings its own advances. So to answer your question, yes. Um, it's a new, again, it's a new game. As I said, uh, dr drone warfare is a cheap solution for um, taking advantage of the, of the side that doesn't have a lot of resources and a lot of money to, for weapons manufacturing. They, can, they do the best they can with um, these low-cost type of uh, weapons. Yeah. And there's more in the pipeline. I remember a few weeks ago, there was some news about the Israelis, and it's not the first country that has designed these things. Uh, Israelis had designed a, uh, a laser beam that could shoot things out of the sky. I don't think they've used it yet, but it's, it's probably not too far away from being deployable. Um, but I want to go to something that's on the political side of warfare. And uh, I, I see that play out right now between Hamas and Israel. And that's the warfare of public relations. And, you know, I, growing up, we all you know, experienced, uh, you know, physical confrontations on the playground and throughout your childhood. And there was something called the sucker punch. And what that was is when someone went up to someone and the other person wasn't aware and uh, smacked them right in the face and then ran off and saying, oh, oh, you know, he's a bully. He's going to beat me up. I, I can't defend myself. And it usually worked unless the other guy that got hit um, got a hold of him. And once he got a hold of him, the sucker punch defense didn't work so well. But um, I see that play out right now with Hamas. They went into Israel, they sucker punched him, and now they're playing in front of the camera that, you know, oh, you know, we're, we're just a small, you know, refugees country that can't defend itself. And look at Israel with all its technology supplied from the, by the United States, and uh, we're being decimated, and... Uh, we're just a victim here. Well, that has played out quite well for Hamas. And um, I think we need to recognize it for what it is. It was a sucker punch. Well, I think it's deep in history. Gene, what, you know, what about the notion of false flag, right? Isn't that a predecessor to the sucker punch idea? Anything goes in hybrid warfare now. Mm -hmm. uh, we played out the usefulness of nuclear weapons in war once we be, developed them to a certain point and too many people got them, now we're sort of at a weird parody where, not parody, but parity, <laughs> where we, <laughs> uh, we can use them geopolitically for mutually assured destruction to avoid the ultimate weapons. And now we know more about the earth and connectivity and the impact, and we know that any city hit is not going to survive. There's no place to go. So we turn to 
now we have the, one of these historical turns where we don't go forward in powerfulness with our weapons, but we become more cagey. And how war is presented, false flags, sucker punches, becomes a very important weapon. We have the weaponization of information. And they always say the pen is mightier than the sword. Well, it's true. And it's happening now. So it's not just that you have cheap drones accessible to any terrorist movement or state, no matter how big or small. It's how you present the information, as Tim aptly said, with the sucker punch. Who's your audience? Who sees it? Who hears it? What's the ultimate narrative? Mm, three things come to mind listening to you guys, just to, to throw it into the, the hopper here. Um, number number one, you talk about clever approaches. Think of Kakovka Dam, um, where you know just a, a few uh, dynamite charges and they wrecked agriculture in, in that part of Ukraine. Um, it, it was a, a, the weaponization of the environment, the, wep the weaponization of agriculture, effectively. <clears throat> what a terrible thing to do. It didn't cost them very much at all, and it hadn't been done before. Very clever stuff. The other thing is that the Ukrainians, you know, had this plan to blow up uh, Russian ships um, and uh, they were relying on um, Elon Musk's uh, low, low altitude uh, satellite system for the Internet. And he, he decided all, all by himself that he didn't want to see them do that. <clears throat> so he cut off at the last minute. He cut off the Internet. Uh, and it was a night attack. They couldn't see. They couldn't. They couldn't locate the ships they wanted to blow up, and so their whole fleet wound up. Uh, a fleet of small boats, of motor boats. Uh, the whole fleet was disabled as a result. And as I saw a video on this. It was really interesting because they were begging him, "Please turn it back on," and he refused. Um, and so what you have is 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 the internet as a weapon. Um, both pro and con. Um, and finally, I want to say that uh, there's been footage released recently of the um, uh, body cams uh, that some of the terrorists were using at the time of the massacre um, in, in Gaza, near Gaza. And, and um, that's a weapon. You know, it's not only, you know, the public relations battle, the hybrid war, it's the fact that you, you, you develop you keep, you edit, you change, whatever, you, you know, use, use the magic of AI on that video. You can tell any story you want um, and you can do it with body cams that fit on your helmet or on your shoulder. And um, that's a weapon too, isn't it? So we have all these hybrid weapons feeding into the ordinary kinetic weapons, you know, the classical weapons and in a hybrid war, all of those things play together so that the one who is most clever gets the spoils. Comments, Tim? Again, uh, you know, each technology brings in different tactics of warfare. Uh, again, if I were to go back in history, look at our own conflict with England in, you know, 1776. Um, guerrilla warfare was seen as a barbaric way to fight and conduct a war in the field. Yet that's how the United States basically had to uh, prevail in most of those conflicts with the uh, British soldiers. So they were outnumbered, outgunned. And so hiding behind trees was more advantageous than lining up in a line every, each and every time and um, getting, getting shot down, getting decimated. Uh, simply the United States didn't have the manpower. So no different here. Guerrilla warfare um, and urban warfare are, are, are tactics that um, can decimate a stronger force. Uh, look at Fallujah with the United States. That was a, a horrible cost and toll on American troops. Um, and I suspect Israel right now is experiencing that in, in Gaza, um, urban warfare issues. So, um, okay, well, let me, let, me, let me go to you, Gene. You know, we, we have what appears to be, it doesn't take a lot of research to figure out, we have a global arms trade that has gone um, recently, that has gone to totally global proportions. And if you, if you go and, and look it up, you will, find, you will find the names of the arms dealers. 
even though their countries may outlaw arms transactions, um, they're on the web. And once you get the names, you know, you can find them and you can make deals. So I, I suggest that it's not only the fact that there's more action going on, but you know, there will be more action because it's easier to find these people and make deals with them and transfer the money, cryptocurrency, what have you, and, and buy arms and have the arms shipped in clever ways to whatever battlefield you want to you want to supply. Seems to me that what we've learned in the Israel war, and for that matter, the Ukraine war, um, is that there's a global trade like never before. You agree? I have no way to measure that, no data or evidence on which I can base it. I'm sure there are entities that are following that and informing governments, and it's part of intelligence. Um, there's so much more going on below the radar now uh, than we will know until it all comes out, if it ever all comes out. But what's really interesting to me is that with the advent of the fourth wave of religious terrorism in 1979, which was the year of the Iranian revolution, uh, we have sort of converted to more uh, low tech in a sense. We've limited ourselves. We've put more rules around warfare, even though it doesn't seem like that. We are not using even small nuclear weapons. We've taken that step away, not only small nuclear weapons, but new peaceful use of nuclear energy is now something we've stepped away from to address climate change. So we are not using our the great scientific breakthroughs of the 20th century in either weapons or peacetime. Now think about that. What then do we, proliferates? We drop down and suddenly we have this great to, new technology, um, cyber technology. And we're using it in space. We're using it in anti-missile missiles, that Star Wars that we didn't think would ever happen during the Reagan time. We're using it in drone warfare, in seagoing drones that, that Ukraine itself has developed. Uh, we're changing the whole face of warfare. And in so doing, all of a sudden, we're seeing casualties mount among civilians. And, and the big question to me is, OK, so we're not bombing cities with nuclear weapons. OK, we're not using them on the battlefield. But what's happening? Is it actually true as it appears that civilian casualties are going up and why? Whoa, that is really an important question. If we have so much precision in these weapons, how come so many civilians are getting killed? That is, that is really a chilling thought. But I, I saved uh, one very important area for now, um, and it is the United States. First of all, we are a big arms dealer. And if you look at the list of you know, publicly listed arms dealers, you find a number of them are in and operating from the United States. And you know that has been the case for a long time. Um, just as we have a big arms industry, we have a lot of weapons dealers here. And, and it strikes me, just a thought, it strikes me that all those uh, um, assault rifles okay, oh. that are being manufactured by our friends in the NRA, um, those rifles may not be staying here. They may be shipped overseas uh, because they're worth a lot. You pay one price to buy it here, mail order, what have you, however you get it, and then you ship it. And I think there must be some people doing that. In any event, we are a big arms dealer and we have arms dealers. That's one side of it. The other side of it is that if you recall in 9-11, there was nothing sophisticated at all. They just flew airplanes. You know, they, they, they took control of airplanes and flew them into buildings and thus had mm, the result they wanted. But in the future, mm, uh, there are all these other weapons that I have listed that terrorists can use here. Um, who knows if we're really secure in our borders to prevent that? So uh, what I'm asking is, that how much of a threat is that? How much of a threat did he see that as? And, and what, what is the concern going forward? Oh, I, 
don't think he would have taken to the airwaves if he didn't have data to support his claim that uh, there is the increased heightened threat of a terrorist attack as a direct result of the United States support of Israel. Um, we do have an open porous border, and it's not even a matter of them bringing weapons across the border. It's a matter of get them obtaining weapons here, you know, domestically in the United States. Mm. Um, all a terrorist has to do is contact one of the, um, you know, white supremacist group, and I'm sure there's a whole cache of weapons that would come their way. So it all could be purchased right here and right now. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's something that Americans need to keep an eye out for. And the old saying, if you see something, say something. Uh, be it, you know, backpack bombs or, or whatever. Um, the director of the FBI uh, is, is very serious about this heightened threat now. So, <laughs> Gene, you know, you said we stepped aside. The world, in, in part anyway, because most countries have, except North Korea, I suppose, have stepped aside from um, rhetoric, Russia to a rhetoric of, over nuclear weapons. And it's not as likely that we would have a nuclear conflagration, especially in a regional war, because we have all these other uh, smaller, more high-tech, more precision weapons, as we have seen. But what about chemical warfare? Uh, what about germ warfare? Um, have we stepped aside from those things too? You know, a, a decade or two ago, it was a great concern, and there was plenty of press over it. We haven't seen much about that, but you know, uh, maybe a uh, an aggressive a terrorist would try that now. What, what do you think? Well, right after 9-11, uh, the military and the government was extremely concerned about the use of biological weapons and chemical weapons. And there were some questions posed to academics about that. One of the problems with biological weapons is they have blowback. You can't control them that easily. They can blow back on you. So they're not an efficient use unless they're used like in a subway system like on Shinrikyo, that terrorist group in Japan used them, um, where it's limited and targeted. So let's put biologicals aside for a moment. You have to be pretty stupid to use them unless you're looking for total martyrdom. Chemical is another story. You can attack a water supply. And water is becoming a weapon in today's world. The, the limitation of clean water, the limitation of water, period. We have seen this in the Gaza War. So one way, there are easier and better ways to strangle your opponent if you're using um, smaller type weapons and using them more creatively. You can attack their infrastructure, their food, their water. And yeah, I suppose you can contaminate their hospitals as long as there's no blowback or contagion. You can do that. So I'm sure terrorists can get very creative. And by the way, the result of this Hamas attack using four terrorist groups in the region, they all planned it together. Um, is going to be a lesson for terrorist groups all over the world, not just America, that they can get away with something this low tech and this cheap as well. And it can be so effective. Yeah, including including people who are either visiting terrorists or indigenous terrorists uh, right, right here in the United States. We could have another terror attack with lessons learned from what is happening in, in, in Israel and Gaza. Um, and I guess the question I would put to you, Gene, in the fullness of history, in the fullness of what is going on here, I'm asking whether terrorism will come to these shores oh. in, in a kind of a payback you know, to our support of Israel. We're much more on um, alert than we were before. Uh, we have means of counteracting this. It's always possible when you have enough arrows coming at you that a few of them are going to come through. But it's not necessary to attack a major power like the United States to bring it down. All you have to do is use proxies. And we have proxies and they have proxies. And what's happening right now with what I call the Third World War 
because their proxies are fighting our proxies. And then, of course, the next step up is to attack us directly. 9-11 changed the world. I mean, we don't say this enough. That was more bang for the buck than almost any attack in history in my book. And we have to kind of sit back and absorb that. And I think to a certain extent, all of our lives have been limited by that attack. We are now subject to a lot more personal scrutiny, less um, privacy, and um, a lot more bureaucracy than we ever wanted. Are you saying that the, the government, such as it is, uh, is keeping up um, with the risk? Proof is in the pudding. It hasn't happened since. That doesn't mean it can't happen again or somebody won't try it. Of course they will. But usually you notice the people who try it now are lone wolves. And uh, the lone wolf theory in technological terrorism is, is part of what we're seeing right now. Um, because they're kind of unhinged and uh, they have no boundaries. But, you know, terrorist movements are unfortunately rational. We had terrorism before this, the uh, American Revolution. The Sons of Liberty were terrorists. Mm -hmm. And Likud was a terrorist organization, came out of Gurgun. And at the Mau Mau in uh, Kenya, they were a terrorist organization that became the government. So you see, terrorism, one man's terrorism is another man's freedom fighter. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. They they have rational means of they they plan these things. This this Gaza attack's been planned since May of 2021. They told us that. Well, that's part of a lesson too that you have to plan it. You have to get your friends together. You have to develop your supply lines um, and so forth. I mean, this is all you could make a a, a playbook. <laughs> Just repeat the playbook. I mean, and do I, I suggest the playbook could repeat, be repeated here, and it would be the same playbook. It's called The Management of Terrorism. It is a terrorist playbook that I read many years ago when I was uh, deciphering Al-Qaeda. You know, Tim, part of this is, is um, not just media, but it's social media, and it's, uh, it's cell phones, and it's um, you know all the ways we can communicate with each other now. It's interesting, and one of the issues uh, that um, Israel was dealing with in Gaza was cut off the communications, because if you can do that, then you know you you hamper your adversary. Um, at the same time, though, social media and other ways to communicate can allow the lone wolf that Gene talks about to become a wolf pack, a large wolf pack. And uh, you know, to me, I think that's that's in the wings. That could happen. So we have a lot of the um, the elements, uh, the ingredients for the development of a, another 9-11 using more sophisticated weapons, using coordinated attacks in various places. Remember, 9-11 uh, was in like, what, three places? Um, and um, it was attempt at a coordinated attack. I think that would, they would try that again. And so communications is very important in all this. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. Um, and the thing about communications, though, is surveillance is such a big part of that now. It's, it's very difficult to avoid surveillance. Uh, so you may even see communications going back to old school where there's, you know, there's a handwritten note passed off to the hand of another individual. Uh, at least you're not being, you know, be de being detected via electronic sur surveillance. Um, the FBI direct continuously say our biggest threat is our domestic internal uh, paramilitary groups. And, um, you know, the Proud Boys comes to mind or the Oath Keepers, uh, groups like that. So who knows? Um, who knows to what extent they, they increase their terrorism, domestic terrorism upon the U.S. government? Uh, so we have to keep our eyes open, not just for Hamas or Hezbollah, but we're going to have to do as Christopher Ray suggests, and that is, uh, really monitor these paramilitary groups in the United States. Yeah, let me add a thought that what we're really talking about here is violence and weapons, where one person can have a weapon and the other person can't or doesn't, chooses not to, and the person with the weapon is in charge. 
And I am thinking of, um, you know, the, the, the trouble with, uh, for example, Jonathan Carl in his new book about the, the world under Trump if he is reelected. Um, because Trump would use the same principles on behalf of government. He would, um, he would uh, employ the uh, Insurrection Act against the people. And we would have some people holding weapons and other people not holding weapons. And then you, you turn everything upside down. So, you know, the old notion that you've been studying for your professional life, Gene, about terrorism, I suggest we can have terrorism on both sides of this issue if we have a terroristic government. Well, you're talking about something like the rise and fall of the Third Reich, which I've been studying for a number of years and published a paper on in 2017, the rise of neo-fascism under the Trump MAGA banner and flag. Uh, they're, they're right from the playbook. We could, except each culture has its own way of responding. We do have basic human responses, you know, protect yourself, protect your family, then protect your community, et cetera, these concentric circles. But we also have a set of what um, my Stanford history teacher used to talk about, the American character. Do we still have enough of that left? to make us an exceptional country that people are dying to come to because they can have more freedom, they can have any place else in the world to be themselves. People don't surrender that very easily. And you know, you can still outwit guns with brains. It just depends on how you use your brain. Well, that, uh, that goes to my last question to you guys, and that is uh, the Israelis are clever. They're into technology. They have things in the pipeline they haven't rolled out yet. Um, they're dealing with problems that they haven't really seen yet. I mean, seen before. Um, and they're capable of changing their plan, changing their approach to things. Um, Tim, how do you see them changing their approach, if at all, to deal with what they have learned over all these weapons that Hamas has brought into the tunnels? I think, again, I'll use the sucker punch analogy, and that is the person who got hit um, is going to make a statement. Um, it's going to get a hold of the guy that sucker punched him and make him pay and show the world that they're going to make him pay. And I think that's, that's uh, Netanyahu's modus operandi right now, is to show the world that Israel will not be sucker punched, and this is the price you pay for doing such a thing. Um, how they change, I think, is up to what kind of peace arrangements or accords that are reached or not reached. And that will dictate how they behave, uh, Israel behaves, and, and all the other nations around Israel, how they'll behave. But, you know, how long do these peace agreements last for? Uh, I don't know. But uh, it, it will change. It, the playing field will change. Um, it just depends to what degree Israel is going to uh, extract revenge on Hamas and the Gaza area. Well, that may be part of the change. They, they may change their public relations policy, their rhetoric. Gene, what, what is your answer to the same question? How is Israel likely to change given what it has learned? It's not easy to change the character of a country. Israel has a record of responding the way it's responding now, banding together, unifying, resolving grave differences, coming together, because they're so small. I mean, the narrowest waist in, in, in Israel, W-A-I-S-T, is 12 miles from the enemy or presumed enemy to the sea. So they can't afford not to unite. And when people are scared, they turn to the hammer or the sword. And a bigger hammer and a bigger sword is going to produce the same result. So I think what's going to happen isn't so much going to come. I mean, I wish it would come from Israel, but I, I don't know if the Netanyahu government will fall or stand. It should fall. And what will replace it, I don't know. But no matter what side of the spectrum you're on, when you're threatened physically, you're going to respond physically in Israel to show never again. We are not going to stand down. We are going to fight back. That's their attitude. That's their national character. We admire them for it in some ways, and we don't admire them for it in other ways. What's going to change is 
what the other nations in the Middle East who want to partner with the United States, have peace and prosperity, what they are going to do in this situation. Right now, they're not stepping up to the plate. Jordan doesn't want to do anything. Egypt doesn't want to do anything. Saudi Arabia is looking for its own best interest. We don't know. And the United States doesn't have the power to change it either. The UN is a helpless giant. And so I suspect there will be a continuation after the war of an occupation by another government until the world screams loud enough and they have to somehow concede something. I'm going to take that as your final comment, Jean, because we're running short on time. What about you, Tim? Do you have any final comment you want to make? No, I think Jean did, said it best. Um, I'd like to see the, the uh, to see a wholesale change on how the Middle East conducts itself, but I think it'll be business as usual. And Jean's correct. I think I think it's going to be a matter of occupation, and um, you'll have skirmishes as the years to come, like we've had seen for many years in the past. I I only offer this one thought. Wouldn't it be better if we could control the global arms market? Um, because every time you look at one of these hotspots and one of these places of war crimes and atrocities, uh, somebody is feeding weapons into that area. And uh, if we could just stop these arms dealers, it would be better. Okay, we're out of time. Thank you very much, both uh, Tim Apicello, co host, and our esteemed guest, Dean Rosenfeld. Thank you so much for this discussion. And I, I have decided we are not going to make it into a musical. Okay. Aloha. <laughs>